You should start off the podcast now. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another week of the Two Guys on Politics podcast. I'm producer Brian Broking. I'm Dan Lipinski. I'm Bill Lipinski. And I'm Ray Hanania. And uh, um, we were having a little fun there for the Facebook people with some of the bloopers. But uh, we're going to be talking about two serious topics. Actually, one topic about the protests in Iran and the protests in China. Um, that's kind of dominating the news. What can we do anything as a democracy to help those protesters that are fighting for their rights in either country? Anybody? Well, I'll talk about uh, China. Uh, in the last two, three days since we selected this topic, I've read a great deal uh, about the situation in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, uh, and both of them happen to agree, and also online, remarkably. Uh, those protests, I think, uh, in China have been built up more by the American media uh, than there really uh, that much going on. Uh, according to the uh, sources that I've read, they are rather small protests. They are not really against the government. They are si simply against the lockdown imposed by the government for such a long time because of the virus. Uh, now, there were some people in Shanghai that uh, were calling for the removal of uh, the president and uh, the breaking up of the Communist Party. But from what I've read, that was a very small group. Most of these demonstrators are very small. And America, we're not going to do anything about it. Uh, we don't want to offend the Chinese. We want the Chinese to be uh, uh, on our side uh, against the Russians. Uh, us and most of the rest of the world still imports so much stuff from China. We don't want to mess around with the commercial aspects of it at the present time either. So no, I don't see us doing anything. Uh, I don't really know if we should do anything, quite frankly. Uh, and I don't know that there's sufficient uh, rebellion on the part of the Chinese people to thrust ourselves into that situation. Okay. Well, shouldn't, shouldn't we be helping the uh, help just like Russia um, likes to foment all the trouble here in the in the U.S. Uh, shouldn't we be uh, helping foment the uh, those people who aren't happy with what's going on in China, the Chinese, uh, to to rise up? Uh, you know, not not doing it officially, uh, but. I think uh, I I hope that we are doing that. You mean the CIA uh, doing something over there, or the agents of the CIA? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, when you when you talk about CIA, though, you you you, you have to be clear about what you're what we're talking about. We're not talking about sending uh, the old days of uh, CIA work. We're, we're talking about uh, the world of uh, social media. And things are a little more, uh, a little more clever and, and quiet that can be done these days. So I hope we're doing that. Now, if you believe the Sun newspaper, uh, there's tanks in the streets in China. I don't necessarily believe the Sun, but you, if you go there today, it, it says that. It seems like these are, they're not big protests, but they're unusual in in China, and that. Uh, at some point, look, uh, at some point, it wasn't our, our hope, uh, supposedly, that if we opened up trade with China, people would eventually uh, want more freedom of, uh, you know, political freedom. It, that, that has not happened. It hasn't happened at all. Uh, we still have to hope that at some point, the, the people in China are going to rise up and, and say that they don't. They don't like what's uh, going on here, and, and the Chinese government seems to have put repression, political repression, over uh, helping advance the economy recently. Uh, and, and there are some talk about that could be a real wind up being a real problem in in China. Uh, so I, I think things are the COVID lockdowns. We saw what it did to people here. I'm, I'm sure people in, in even Worst lockdowns in in China are are feeling the same way. It's just it, it's human nature. So, 
I, I don't think uh, the Chinese government's ready to fall, but I think this could be something. There's always a chance, um, and it's got to start somewhere. Does, well, does instability, Brian, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, does instability in a country undermine the financial world and maybe weaken the Chinese, you think, their, their financial grip that they have in our country? I, I think it certainly does, but I, I think the the bigger kind of argument here is both of you guys kind of downplayed the severity of these protests in China. And I, I think we should be doing the exact opposite, both in the U.S. media and throughout the world. We should sell these protests as true protests is what they are. The, the Chinese government is cracking down on different forms of media throughout the country and trying to stop the spread of this information. And you can say this is or isn't Tiananmen Square. But this is probably the closest China has been to Tiananmen Square ever since that since 1989. If we look at it, the world's economy is slow. China is so reliant on exports that they're destabilizing. We talked months ago about Evergrande and the different real estate companies that were basically building bridges to nowhere that now no one can pay for and are having to get bailed out by the CCP. Now we have worth three years into COVID, and the numbers in China look like the U.S. during its huge spikes. And they have this zero COVID policy where they're essentially locking the doors of apartment buildings and not letting people outside in Shanghai. I have a friend from college who used to work, live, work and live in Shanghai, who has now moved because to Singapore because he's done and fed up with this policy of constantly just locking things down. And he's obviously got the ability to do this. He lived and worked in the U.S. And, you know, he comes from a well-off family. Not everyone's allowed to do that. But I think this is a very tense moment for the Chinese government and a way to kind of see the, the world is changing. We've been in a very stable world environment for the past 12 years. The economy has been good. Money has been free. You can basically do whatever you want. Coming up here, we're going to see some, some more problems. The Fed's going to keep hiking rates in the U.S. This is going to affect China and destabilize the country more. I think this is a major turning point where the next generation can take over in China. Why wouldn't it? Would it does anybody believe that this is an opportunity that uh, I think I agree with Dan. This is an opportunity where we should be uh, thinking of ways to foment you know, more trouble there because when there's no trouble there and the, this uh, tyrannical government of China is not facing protests, uh, all they're thinking about is how to attack us with uh, cyber assaults, how to undermine our economy, um, what are they going to do in, uh, you know, in Taiwan and Hong Kong and you know, those other territories. They, they shut down that one newspaper, arrested all the journalists. I think this is a great opportunity that a little protest, even if it's just sparked, uh, as Bill, you mentioned, by the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, wave of uh, coronavirus in that country. And it's not so much like you know, we can't compare it to what happened in Iran. Um, I think it could explode and grow. And I think we should help it grow. We should figure out a way to covertly help it grow and keep pressure on China so they take their eye off the ball in terms of hurting us and figure out what they need to do in their own country. Well, I hope that the three of you fellows are correct, but I'll still stand by my position. I don't believe we will do anything. I don't believe we will even get involved with the social media aspects of it. This administration does not want to offend communist China. They want communist China to switch sides in the Russian war with Ukraine. They want them to be on our side. They don't want that government blaming us either for fomenting, fomenting, <coughs> fomenting this riot. Uh, so I hope you guys are right, but I'll stick with my position that nothing's going to happen. Well, but do we legitimately think they're going to switch sides on the Russia argument? Russia supplies most of their fuel, which... Do I think so? No, I don't think so. Right. But that doesn't mean that the Biden administration doesn't uh, think so. After all, they just made a deal with Venezuela to buy some more oil. It's okay to drill in Venezuela and pollute the air, but we don't want to drill our own oil and pollute the air. Is this a leadership problem in the United States, you think? I mean, 
uh, you know, not that I think anything about Trump or Biden being better or worse, but what would Trump have done? He probably would have figured out a way to get, you know, contracts for his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, or, you know, his kids. Um, but uh, would anybody? It, it To me, it just makes me feel sad because all my life I've grown up with a tough U.S. leadership when it came to foreign policy, and we never shied away from doing the right thing. Um, and now it just seems like, you know, we have a president that doesn't want to aggravate it. You know, let's could be worse. You know, let's not make it worse by, you know, doing what needs to be done. It's uh, a little disappointing. There, there's got to be smart ways to do what we need to do without stumbling or, you know, creating a nuclear war. Well, I, I think what you you just actually pointed out is specifically the problem, which is I think this is a generational problem. I think the way you guys view this this issue versus me is far, far different. You guys grew up in a combative U.S. versus USSR world where that was the end-all be-all. And that frankly isn't the way the world works anymore. We're, we're all interdependent on each other. Russia is launching missiles into Ukraine and all of Europe still taking its oil. We're so interdependent that war on small scales of the, you know, Russia-Ukraine war, it, it doesn't actually destabilize the globe as a whole. And I think for the most part, you look at Putin in Russia, you look at Xi Jinping in China, you look at Biden, Trump, whoever you choose in the U.S., you have an old guard, an old generation. And I think it's time for a new generation to see the world as a trade forward policy make partnerships with important strategic allies going forward, like India and Pakistan, and then move forward from there. No, you know what that sounds like? That sounds like the 20 years ago, like I said, the U.S. saying, oh, we're going to trade with China, and they're going to uh, they're going to change then. And, and all it did was make China a much more powerful country, uh, more repressive uh, politically, and, and a you know, it grew the military threat tremendously. So I and I generally agree with you, but we we can't look at it as look, nationalism is always going to be there. And and we can't think that, oh well, we're gonna have that used to be, you know, that that used to be the idea, oh, you know, if we if we trade, then you know, countries are gonna be too reliant on each other to 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 threaten each other. Uh, but we see that's not true. There was at one time a theory that, um, a sort of tongue-in-cheek theory that two countries with McDonald's would never fight each other. Uh, but we see that's that's not the case. So I, I, I think that, uh, yes, it, this is not 20 years ago. This is not 50 years ago, uh, 100 years ago. Things have changed. But some things are, are constant, and we need to... We need to realize that we need to realize that uh, we ha have to have a strong military. We have to be a strong country uh, that is uh, that, that that others, our adversaries, fear, uh, and hopefully we never ha have to use it. So I, I, I think there's a uh, I, I think there's sort of a, a median here between what we're what we're all talking about. What and Brian, that. Go ahead. And what is that? Well, it's not. It's it's much easier to say, you know, one way or or the other way. It's it's much more nuanced uh, when we're talking about something in the middle. Yes, trade in the not just trade, but the ability to to communicate um, has changed the world, and so it, it's different than it was, but you always have to recognize and you, you, you cannot forget that nations are there to you know, defend themselves and some nations are always gonna be aggressive and wanting to, to expand. That, that doesn't change even though we're, we're so inter interconnected. And okay. so I'm not gonna give you an easy answer what that, what that means. Uh, I just want everyone to understand, I'm all for a very strong American military. I want us to have the strongest military in the world, which I believe that we do. Uh, I also would like to see us spreading freedom and democracy around the world. 
if at all possible, which we have done on many occasions in the past. But right now, I do not see the opportunity to do anything in China in that direction. And certainly, I do not believe that the Biden uh, administration is going to do anything there to destabilize the situation. I want to make mention, O'Brien talked about, or Dan talked about, uh, you know, destabilizing the, uh, the economy. Uh, well, the, uh, the war in Ukraine has destabilized the world economy to a certain uh, extent. And with the plants being closed down in uh, China, that's even destabilizing the economic situation in the world. So the, both of those things are coming. And we sit here with a very significant inflation rate in this country. Uh, and a lot of people are predicting, you know, a strong recession very shortly. So I think we have enough problems on our plate right now, unless, you know, we can be sure we're gonna be successful in whatever we do. I think I have to go along as much as I hate to with Joe Biden and uh, sit back, relax and see what happens. And, and Brian, you know, I'm not picking on you because you're a young person, but since you pointed out that divide, I mean, you're right, it's an older attitude that uh, reflects our experience. But, you know, the one thing I think we have learned is you can't really, you know, build up a, an ideal world with a thug or a tyrant. It, it just doesn't work. And that's what the governments we have in China, uh, Iran and Russia, these are thugs and tyrants who are, you know, thinking that, yeah, they're going to exploit us and use us to get things, but we can't turn our backs on them because I don't believe they would live up to the principles of freedom and democracy that we have. And the other thing is, I think that it was a mistake. You know, there's this big uh, fantasy world about globalization, where they talk about how we can all live together and everybody will be equal. It's not like that, because what happens is globalization only makes these tyrannical governments more economically stronger, militarily stronger, but their people don't feel it. Their, their people don't, you know, get to experience that freedom that we want globalization to actually bring when they sold it to us. I think that's a big mistake. We should never have done anything with China or Russia. We should shut the door on them. And if this results in less Chinese junk being sold in the United States, I'm all for fueling the fires over there to, to stop it because it's just, uh, it's terrible. Well, well, one, the Chinese junk, I mean, our, our iPhones and, you know, computers also come from China. It's not just like, you know, junk. But part of the kind of piece that I want to circle back to is the idea that one, I think, and I think this is generally, you know, cross-generational. I think the world is the most secure place it can be if the United States military is better than any military throughout the world. Yeah. I think we all agree on this, but I think, I it's, think so. it's true that in a ground war, China has no chance. The U.S. Air Force would obliterate the Chinese Air Force. And essentially, we're getting to a point in military history where infantry, just general troop numbers that China does have on us, doesn't matter as much because of how important the technology and kind of command and control of war is now versus 50, 100 years ago. So then going to the next point is the idea that the US has ever successfully created a democracy. I don't think we have. We couldn't even make Iraq or Afghanistan a democracy. How are we gonna make China a democracy? Who's a hundred thousand, we could have transported the US military, plopped it in Afghanistan, doubled the population. We can't do that with China. There's no way through military force we're ever going to do this. It's going to have to come from within. And we can, as we said, you know, push the buttons there. But there there's no military power that's going to make China a democracy. The people within the country are going to have to get rich enough to realize there's more to the world. And what that is, is embracing U.S. culture and exporting U.S. culture. And that comes down to being harder on American companies who export films and different devices and technology to China, Facebook needs to be able to operate as Facebook. 
You know, American movies shouldn't blur out the American flag in China. We need to be stronger about that, about exporting American values rather than American force. I think that's a far better way to get democracy to spread throughout the world. I, I think we brought democracy to uh, Taiwan. I think we brought it to Japan. And I think it, we brought it to Germany. So those are three areas where we were successful. Now, you're going to tell me that was a long time ago. But nevertheless, you said we never accomplished that. We certainly did. Is it, isn't Partially. there, though, a, isn't there uh, a benefit, no, yeah, yeah. though, from, isn't there a benefit from destabilization of countries like uh, Russia? They're depleting their arm, armaments. Uh, you know, the destabilization and these protests in Iran, uh, they're focused on trying to get their people in line. That's less terrorism plotting on their part. And these protests in China, doesn't it take away their focus from, you know, uh, take, you know, the risk game, the economic risk game that they play with us, where they're buying up our country and, and taking over, you know, our uh, building into our economy and our, our you know, investments? Isn't destabilization of these three really tyrannical countries good? It can't be bad. It has to be good, isn't it? Or am I wrong? I generally disagree with that because I think destabilizing a country as powerful as Russia or China, specifically talking about nuclear capabilities, is net bad for the world. I think... Ronald Reagan did a very important thing in the 80s, which is he essentially spent the USSR into oblivion. And why is that? Because capitalism, economic freedom, is what builds strength throughout the world now. And we saw that in the 80s, and we essentially spent the USSR into oblivion. It's going to be really hard to do that with China. But I think if the CCP continues to lock their country down for years and years and years, we can also outspend the CCP if we really want to. Well, I think a question that you have to ask, and, and that's related to China and also Iran, which we're going to talk about, and any of these other countries, is what is the next? If the government falls, what's next? Or if the leader falls, you know, that's a question that people have asked about Russia. Putin goes, who, who's next? Um, and I, I think uh, if we can, uh, can we tran Can we uh, go over, move over to Iran right now? Yeah, let's move to yeah. Iran. All yeah. right. So the question is: So what happens? What happens if the um, this Iranian government is overthrown? Now, the the hope is somehow democratic forces would take over, but it's more likely that. The um, Revolutionary Guard, IRG, uh, takes over. Uh, and is that better? Uh, in some ways, I mean, I've, what I've read is essentially if they took over, uh, they probably would uh, ease up on some of the, uh, you know, uh, the repression of women, uh, some things like that. But they're certainly not going to change at all you know, when it comes to what they do on, on the outside. Now, I, I'm not sure what to what exactly to think about that. Um, but uh, you know it, that is something always to keep in mind. And it's so hard for uh, unless we're experts to know uh, do you even have a good guess about what comes next and and what the next after that, then what happens? And, and so, I mean, I, I there there's certainly some a lot of truth with. Brian said is, well, what, what happens next if we destabilize a country? Um, and there's going to be differing opinions on, on it. And there's good arguments probably for, you know, depending on what we, what we see and, we, and what we know. So, uh, so who wants to go, uh, who wants to start off in Iran? What, what, what should we do? I think well, my I, answer, he probably knows more about it than any one of us. I, I don't, but I probably don't know any more than every, everybody here. You guys are very good at, you guys, uh, both Dan and Bill, you got great experience in actual diplomacy and serving at a congressional level. It's huge. And Brian brings a great economic aspect to uh, our world. Uh, but, you know, as far as Iran, uh, it's hard to build a nuclear bomb 
when your focus is trying to keep the people from tearing down your government. So that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, the, as this protest goes, unfortunately, people re respond to pain more than they do to, you know, not doing anything. So the more people that are being killed, it fuels a greater desire on people in Iran to stand up and fight against this uh, government that really is uh, tyrannical, really is oppressive, you know, in the worst way possible. Uh, we don't even hear about, you know, the people that are murdered. Um, you've said something about the Ayatollahs um, and you just disappear and there's no process to ever find out what happened to those people. So, you know, and, and I'm not saying that what they had before under the Shah of Iran was any better. Uh, Iran has been under turmoil for, you know, two uh, dictatorships and it's really just uh, just uh, this tyranny has been just in a different form. But I, I think it's good that they're focused internally rather than focused on all the turmoil that they foment, you know, around, throughout the Middle East. You know, their war with uh, the Gulf, their effort to, uh, you know, block peace, you know, in the Middle East. Um, I would like to see the Iranian people overturn this government. And yeah, Dan, you're probably right. I don't know what would happen after it might be worse. You know, that's one of the sad risks, you know, when the Shah, remember when he uh, stepped down and we thought maybe there might be democracy and quickly the Ayatollahs took over there. And um, it's not a great track record uh, in transition. When we look at Iraq, you know, here we spent all those years in Iraq and what did we end up creating? You know, I'm not sure Iraq is the model democracy or ever will be either. So, I mean, we have to kind of, uh, you know, kind of not impose our, uh, you know, democracy on others. But uh, as you said, Dan, I think we have to try to figure out what would come of this. You know, what are the op realistic options? Um, it could be that the Iranian, you know, the, the uh, Iranian guard, the revolutionary guard would actually take control. Maybe it won't be such a religious country, you know, the way they are now. But I, I just, you know, it's, the longer the turmoil, look at Syria. Syria was another example of a country that was really fomenting violence in the Middle East. What they did in Lebanon, blowing people up all the time, um, you know, causing all kinds of trouble. Um, and look at Syria now. They, they can barely hang on to their government. With, and they haven't been involved in a lot of these you know, uh, terrorism exploits that they've been involved in in the past. So there is a good side, unfortunately, to this. You know, it may be the only alternative to uh, tyranny. Okay. I, I think, I, I think uh, to, to follow up on that, I guess, as a little aside, and the idea of whether or not some kind of regime change is good, um, We've seen this. I mean, the, the U.S. is playing Iran right now in the World Cup. Um, the USA is winning currently. Uh, but we've seen two interesting things develop as kind of a part of the you know, World Cup nationalism that's built into these games, where first in the first game, Iran knelt or did, did something where they were showing defiance towards the regime which they were explicitly told not to do about the protests and, and the killing of that young woman in the country by the morality police. So we kind of already see in what I was talking about earlier, a younger generation is not for that kind of thing. You look at these guys, if they do happen to advance or if they do well consistently, they, they can become national icons and kind of thought leaders and people who move the country forward. And that could be the next generation. So what we then get there is we stir this stuff up in the U.S. where the U.S. posts, the U.S. men's team posts this flag of Iran missing the icon in the center of the flag. This whole controversy brews and everyone seems to forget that the Iranian players themselves have called out their own government as they should. And, and we try and make this, this nationalism thing that goes down to the soccer level of a bunch of guys in their 20s and 30s playing each other, even though most of them are on the side of the Americans. Freedom will win eventually, 
We just can't force it down people's throats. Do any of you believe that we should still be the policemen of the world in, as, as part of our strong foreign policy, try to bring freedom and democracy to all these countries around the world? Or should we focus more on our own problems and solve those? Don't you think we'd be a better, wouldn't you think our problems would be easier to handle if the rest of the world were, you know, a democracy? So, you know, I, I still think that we need to make it our priority to uh, promote democracy and freedom in other countries. And maybe it's, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, supporting, you know, protest, you know, uh, secretly or uh, convincing governments, you know, to become democratic. That didn't work with Russia, obviously, with, you know, uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin and uh, uh, everything that happened, you know, there. We thought we were going to see a free and democratic Russia. And that dream disappeared actually pretty quick, although we didn't want to believe it. Um, but I, yeah, I think we have to still be the, if we're the leader of the free world, we have to be the leader. We can't have like two, you know, it's a paternal system, like in a family. You can't have two fathers in a family. There's one father and you listen to that guy um, until one of the sons takes over. But uh, I think we need to be that father of this country and this world and, you know, try to impose other on other countries the, the practices to do the right thing, freedom, democracy, and to treat human life with respect. Yeah, it's a big burden, but I think we have to do it. But but if it, we're using the word policeman, I think that's traditionally a word that has been used for decades, policeman of the world. But if you really look at it, a policeman doesn't, a policeman keeps the peace, doesn't do things like we did in Iraq in, in thinking that somehow we could instill democracy there. I, I think the United States is not going to be doing anything like that for a long time, uh, where we go in there like we did in Iraq and overthrow a government and, and think that democracy is gonna, gonna break out. Uh, but that's very different than, you know, looking at, you know, supporting human rights around the world. Now, obviously during the Cold War, we supported governments that you know, had terrible human rights records, but at that point we knew that it was, you know, a a bipolar world, and we needed to win the Cold War. You know, now it's a lot tougher making those those decisions when it comes to, you know, human rights. And we all say we should the U.S. should uphold human rights throughout the world, and we all agree on that in principle. In practice, we see that it doesn't always happen because there's still you know, certain, <laughs> well, in the Middle East, we, we certainly, sometimes we, we figure we got to choose our side, and uh, and we do when we turn our backs on uh, the idea of, of, of human rights. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated world, but I think in general, we need to stand up for the principle of human rights. I think we, as I said earlier, we need to be feared. Uh, but I think everyone knows now, after what happened in Iraq, we're not going to roll the U.S. military into a country to overthrow a government for a long time. And that's a good thing in the sense that, obviously, Iraq was a, um, I think most people believe it was a big mistake. I certainly do. Um, but it also means that countries are a little less concerned uh, about what the U.S. is, is going to do. But we, we need to use not just our soft power, but our clandestine power uh, to try to promote human rights and, and democracy uh, around the world. We can all agree with that. Great. All right. Any other final thoughts from anybody or? No, I think it's been, very, it's been a very interesting program. Uh, to a great extent, it's almost been sort of philosophical uh, about uh, things which is, uh, I think, somewhat of a change uh, for us. But I thought it was a good program. All right. All right, I'm Ray Hanania. I'm Bill Lipinski. I'm Dan Lipinski. 
And I'm producer Brian Broking. And we'll see everybody next week, hopefully, um, at another episode of Two Guys on Politics.